arguably one of the more powerful features in your image editor, you know, something like GIMP or Photoshop, is the ability to blend multiple layers. By having multiple layers on top of each other, and by being able to change how they interact, we can actually do a lot of interesting things. Today, we're going to be looking at the layer blending modes available in GIMP. Now, this sounds a little bit weird because, well, they are normally in plain sight and we normally, you know, pick which one works through trial and error. But I think it would be useful to actually, you know, try to better understand what each blending mode actually does. And that could guide us into choosing a better blending option for whatever it is we're trying to do. You're watching another Random Wednesday episode on 0612TV. Hello and welcome back to another Random Wednesday episode. So, as promised, what we're gonna do is basically we're gonna pop open the blending modes in GIMP and more or less go down the list and try to understand each one of those blending modes. Of course, we're gonna jumble up the order a little bit wherever it makes more sense to do so, but yeah, I'll try to make this as clear and as unrambly as I possibly can. Just as a very quick preface so you can understand, you know, the demonstrations that are shown to you, we're gonna always have two layers stacked on top of each other. Whenever I'm demonstrating a particular blending option, I have the upper layer selected, and I'm applying that different blending option to that upper layer. So yeah, this is just to, you know, sort of get us on the same page when it comes to how we actually set things up. So without further ado, let us jump into all the blending options one by one. First and foremost is the normal mode. This of course is the most basic blending of two layers. As you bring down the opacity of the upper layer, well, it simply gets more transparent. So what's happening here is just a simple averaging of the colors between the two images. One particular application of this that I like and isn't immediately obvious is when you try to apply an effect. For example, in this case, I've opted for a color grade except I've kinda overdone it. And I still have the original in a new layer underneath. I can actually reduce the effects of the color grade by bringing down the transparency of the upper layer. This allows some of the original color to bleed through and in turn makes the effects more subtle. Next up, we have Dissolve, which is a pretty interesting effect, albeit one that I don't use very often. When you bring down the opacity slider of the upper layer, Certain pixels are just removed entirely, and these are sort of at random, so you kind of get a weird kind of grainy feel. I don't use this very much, but if at any point of time you feel like, you know, you want to add a little bit of random noise to your image, this is one way to do it. Next up is Lighten Only and Darken Only. As their names imply, basically what GIMP will do is it'll look at the upper layer, if the upper layer darkens the lower layer, in the case of darken only, then those pixels are kept. If the lower layer is darker, then those are kept instead. The opposite is true for lighten only. Of course, the upper layer is only applied when it is lighter. This can be useful when we're trying to composite something with a flat color. We can also use this to do some interesting double exposure kind of effects. Next up is screen. Now, screen actually treats transparency a little bit differently. In your upper layer, the darker a pixel is, the more transparent it becomes. Conversely, the brighter it is, the more opaque it is. This of course creates an interesting transparency effect that is derived from the brightness of the image. This is another way to composite elements that have a dark background but a brighter foreground. This of course works because the darker background falls away to nothing while the brighter background stands out and remains opaque. Next up is Dodge and Burn. These are actually quite popular in touching up photos of people, so that is, you know, what they do when they do airbrushing to make a person look better in a photo. Basically, these techniques tweak the brightness of an image in a very natural kind of manner. Dodge lightens whereas Burn darkens and the intensity of the effects is dependent on the brightness of the pixels in that particular layer. To make this effect look more natural, you can actually use gradients to trigger this effect, 
like what I'm doing here to the cat's eyes. Notice how it actually glows at the top and the brightness slowly falls off. Doing things this way can make the effects look more gradual, which is of course more pleasing to the eye. Next up, we have addition and subtraction, which directly changes the brightness of an image. Now, addition in particular is very useful when you want to composite something that is bright, for example, fire. Of course, when you add brightnesses, you will get a greater brightness at the end of the day, which is why this is very useful for glow type effects. As for subtraction, I don't personally use it very much. A lot of the time, it is used as an intermediate step in other image filters. One example of this being Unsharp Mask. Next up is Difference, which is actually the same operation as subtraction. But of course, when you perform a subtraction, there is a possibility of getting negative brightnesses, which of course gets clipped to black. When you use a Difference Blending Mode, all the negative values get flipped back up to positive. So what you're seeing is the raw difference between the two layers. Using this blending option is very helpful in aligning images together because when an image is misaligned, chances are you can see very bright highlights around the places that are misaligned. Correcting for them is pretty easy and when you no longer see any bright highlights, you know that the two images are in line. Next up is Multiply and Divide. Once again, different operations to change up the brightness of an image. Interestingly, Multiply is like the opposite of Screen. The brighter a pixel is, the more transparent it gets. And the darker a pixel is, it becomes, well, more and more visible. And as a result, what you see are the darker parts of the upper image. As for Division, well, the darkest pixels have the lowest brightness. Therefore, dividing by these very low values will produce a very large result. That's why the darker a pixel is, the brighter the final result will be, and by a very large margin. Then we have hard light and soft light. Now, hard light is actually a combination between screen and multiply, in the sense that, well, if you have a color that is pure white, that shows up as opaque. If you have a color that is pure black, that shows up as opaque as well. It is the middle grays that get transparent. So the closer you get to middle gray, the more transparent that particular color is. Soft light is a subtler version of this where even at the extreme ends of brightness, you don't get that pure color. It is still semi-transparent. Incidentally, for what appears to be most versions of GIMP, soft light actually means the same thing as overlay. An overlay is another blending option in the drop down, but yeah, for a lot of cases, they actually do the same thing, which is a long time bug if I'm not wrong. <sighs> Moving on, we have green extracts and green merge. Now, these are pretty interesting in a sense that there are some ways for you to play with the green of a particular layer. Green extract is really cool in a sense that it can perform something like an emboss kind of effect. To do this, all you have to do is to duplicate a layer, set the upper layer to grain extract, and then just shift the two layers slightly out of alignment. As you can see, this creates some interesting borders around the subject of the image. Grain merge allows you to apply a grainy layer, just like the one we've just created, to another layer. So for example, if we were to merge our existing two layers together, and then create a new layer, and set the upper layer to grain merge, well, now the lower layer looks like it has the grainy pattern of the upper layer. For best results when using these two blending options, your upper layer should be set to grayscale. If you don't do that, it makes the colors of the lower layer kind of funky, and that may be an effect you want. But if you really just want the grain, you might want to actually desaturate the upper layer first. Finally, we have hue, saturation, color, and value. These four blending modes actually rely on your understanding of the HSV color model. I've explained this in great detail before in the past, so I won't go into too much detail about this. Suffice to say, HSV is a different way to specify colors, where hue refers to, well, the particular color you want. Saturation defines how rich the color will be, while value defines how bright the color will be. 
When you choose the hue, saturation, color, or value blending modes, we'll now have to think about the two layers that this affects in terms of HSV. As a matter of fact, when you choose hue, what you're doing is you're saying I want to keep the hue from the upper layer and take the saturation and value from the lower layer. When you say saturation, then saturation comes from the upper layer, whereas hue and value comes from the lower layer. If you choose color, then both hue and saturation comes from the upper layer. The lower layer only provides value. And finally, if you choose value, then of course the upper layer supplies the value, in other words the brightness, and the lower layer supplies both hue and saturation. So yeah, these are some very interesting ways for you to recolor your images. I've used both hue and color on several occasions, and yeah, they can give your image a very interesting stylistic look. This works particularly well if you're trying to layer a gradient on top of a photograph. So yeah, those were all the blending modes in GIMP. Sure, you could probably get away with doing trial and error when choosing a blending option, but having a general idea of what each one of them does is probably quite useful as well. Of course, to be more familiar with what each blending mode actually does, you have to do your own experiments. Try it with pictures, try it with gradients, in fact, try it with empty layers and then just use the brush to draw some stroke and see what happens. Thank you very much for watching, I hope you learned something today. But until next time, you're watching 0612TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may be interested in a playlist of my earlier work on photography and image editing subjects. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.